Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Alright, uh, turn that down. Hi guys, uh, hope everyone is uh, joining me. I'm just uh, getting set up here. Four o'clock, top of the hour. And uh, we're going to do some continuations on uh, some things from previous stream. Uh, which is sort of like a city block environment scene. Uh, using ZBrush and Keyshot. Hi again, my name is Tony Leonard and I am a 2D, 3D concept artist based out of here in Los Angeles, California. And I'd like to thank uh, all the folks over at Pixelogic uh, for helping me out uh, with this stream and letting me present here. And uh, if you give me mo just a moment, I'm just going to get set a little bit, make sure everything is smooth sailing. And uh, if you'd like, uh, please do give me a shout out in the stream, in the chat, and uh, let me know how things are working out. In fact, excuse me for just one second. I'll be right back. Close the door, grab a drink, get settled, get ready for the next two hours. I am back. So, uh, for some reason, let me see here. Let's see if I can bring up the chat so that I can see you guys. second here. For some reason brought things up and I could see you guys. Unfortunately I cannot see my chat window so the page just loaded without it. Just trying to bring up the if you guys will excuse me for a second, I'm trying to make sure that I get uh, everybody set up so that I can see your chat for some reason. I loaded everything, but uh, I cannot see the chat yet. So just a second. Uh, oh, there we go. Sure why, but I'm loading the page, but I cannot uh, see you guys' uh, comments in the chat there. I think perhaps. Just gonna reload the Twitch page. Just give me one second. Excited to get uh, started with you guys today. Uh, I have done a little bit of work over the week and uh, come up with a finished little set for what I was building last time around and I'm just gonna open it here and get it going for you guys go. Alright. 
There's a couple of big things that I needed to open. Uh, unfortunately, over the last week, uh, since I've done some work, uh, some of these files have gotten a little bit on the heavy side. But uh, I'll show you what I got here. So I'm going to open it on the key shot side, and then uh, hopefully uh, my render part portion. Uh, in fact, uh, I'll show you a little bit of uh, two different things. Uh, I'll open my finished uh, scene and key shot. And today I have a couple of things that I'm going to be talking about with you guys. And one is uh, having uh, my scene set out and layout in ZBrush, which basically I take up most of a gridded plane uh, just to show sort of like a, a shot that has a part of a block. And uh, as you can see here on my screen, I have one of the buildings that I was working on. Uh, just got to cycle back to my previous layout. As I have a lot of parts in this scene that I was building up. So we have something like this here. Uh, unfortunately, whoops crazy keyboard stuff. I gotta get used to this flipping and flopping thing where I'm going in between Mac and PC constantly and my fingers need to remember the actual keyboard layouts for each part. Uh, but we're heading somewhere in this direction whereas probably in previous streams you saw me work on this scene um, having only a few elements at the bottom here uh, and some of these buildings that I made actually into a sort of like a, a personal kit bash uh, and speaking of kit bash there's a few air small areas where um, I should probably explain that most of this uh, structure that you see that you, I've been building uh, in the last couple of weeks here uh, most of the parts are simple uh, Z model or geometry so if I was to maybe alt click on some of these um, and then show you the poly frames uh, it's really simple geometry right just using uh, extrudes bevels um, uh, some of the cube mesh features uh, also insert mesh uh, in one of the insert mesh brushes for primitives uh, I'm using the Q mesh insert from that to do a lot of things uh, a few items have uh, curved tubes like say the round trim around some of these buildings here uh, and then also I believe uh, one of the buildings that are newer since then is I think in a previous uh, stream I designed this building here out of uh, Z Modeler and utilized only a few small uh, kit bash pieces uh, to give a shout out I used a few parts from uh, Vitaly Bulgarov and his Mega Structures kit uh, just a few, add a few details and accents, uh, maybe some some panels and maybe some spire tops like the air conditioning unit parts that are on the top of the building. Um, I use those to lay out the building and, and get it looking somewhat close to what we need uh, with enough detail to then take off and do something. So there's a couple of different things here. One is uh, today I'm going to try to do sort of more of a realistic render uh, with actual materials and show you uh, all of those materials and how they come out. Uh, the process in which I went through from ZBrush to kick it over to KeyShot, which involves using the ZBrush uh, to KeyShot bridge, uh, which is a pretty easy and simple feature uh, to get to use, uh, to get, install, and use. Uh, to get it, you, know, you need to purchase it from the Pixelogic site uh, and then go through the instructions to install it into your ZBrush uh, layout. Uh, and then from there, um, you can take and go to what are your render palette, uh, and then which I usually have docked over to the side, by the way. Uh, and then what I do is I go over to external render and select key shot. So that basically just uh, lets that uh, ZBrush know that every time you do a BPR using the utilizing this button here. In fact, I'll shift M over the BPR, and it'll show you this button here and with one click what it'll do is it'll prepare files uh, much like a, a GoZ feature and take everything and read through the document read all the geometry 
and kick it over to a new file inside of Keyshot. Um, before I get too ahead of things, I actually need to be able to see you everyone's comments. For some reason when I loaded the page I'm on the Pixelogic Twitch but I need to uh, I need to display for myself the actual chat for everybody. Give me one second while I figure that out. go uh, but for some reason for some reason I cannot see you guys on the chat and I don't know why I'm so sorry uh, let me just take one second to figure this out sorry about the hang up guys That's why sometimes it is very difficult to get some of this stuff going. <laughs> My apologies. I want to be able to answer questions from you guys. For, for some reason, uh, I loaded the Pixelogic page and I'm not, for some reason, able to see everyone's comments. So, but I want to be able to do that. at times has one of the oddest uh, their site has one of the oddest UIs I would think that it would be pretty uh, straightforward but for some reason I see video but no that's okay if it takes me a second to figure this out I'll go I'll go over time and uh, we'll kind of figure some things out together but I, I, I definitely uh, wanted to be able to answer questions from everyone so ah there we go okay so I'm just gonna drop a message into the chat and if anyone's watching uh, give me a, a shout out and I'll try to go ahead and proceed I just wanted to let uh, give you guys a way to ask me questions again and be able to answer them. So I think I got the chat up. I finally found it in the UI here. Sorry about that. So anyway, uh, one of the things that I wanted to go through was being able to kick uh, some of this stuff out from ZBrush also to Keyshot and then from Keyshot show you sort of uh, one of my setups for how I'm doing some of my materials. Lighting the scene, uh, which is kind of a, a difficult matter. Um, that probably I should explain and then placing materials and then finally coming up with a render and talking about the passes that I use and will set up in Photoshop so I'm just gonna jump ahead and show you a little bit uh, of what I've got inside of Photoshop Here we go. All right, so this is a render that I've put together for you guys. Did a solid, I think, hour, maybe hour and 20 minute uh, render uh, of everything that I've been working on thus far uh, over the last couple of streams. And by now, at this point, you really get to see how kind of everything is uh, shaping up. Uh, it's a little grainy, uh, but there's a couple of features that I'm gonna be uh, running to prepare this file. Uh, that may reduce some of the little small bits of artifacting, um, some of the trim around the masked areas where there's an actual uh, transparent uh, mask uh, for the buildings, uh, which actually I'm going to use uh, our clown pass to kind of clip some of this out even a little bit more. And uh, just as a point of noting, I guess, uh, this Photoshop file is a 32 bit uh, render. 
So in other words, it's a 32-bit Photoshop document rendered out at about an hour and I believe 20 minutes. And uh, all of these elements that are in here are pretty much lit. Like I have light materials that are placed into different parts of the model. Uh, like say in the buildings, some of the trim uh, have lights in them. The neon sign, which I might have probably worked out last time. Uh, a lot of these are from Keyshot uh, Lumen materials that were switched over from, from Lumen uh, area lights over to wattage power lights. Uh, and then I'm probably going to post-process these in Photoshop uh, along with a lot of the windows and add different types of glows, um, a clipping mask and actually uh, non-destructive masks uh, and kind of show you guys a little bit under the hood of what's happening uh, leading up to a paint over. So there will be some illustrative uh, efforts going into this and then I think I'm actually going to kick the model over a second time uh, now that it's complete and sort of show everybody, oh, thank you, uh, Ox Art V. <laughs> Hope I'm pronouncing your name right. But uh, everything in here is an individual element, I guess. So in other words, the subtool of these two cloned buildings are one. Uh, the Z modeler I use to create blocks out for the centerpiece. Uh, and if you remember, when we started, pretty much we had uh, probably some flooring here, like leading up to the curb. Uh, two pillars in this back wall, which borrows sort of a motif, uh, a motif from uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. And I actually use Z Modeler to build out the tiles and then space them out and duplicated them along a block which represented the wall. So I have a material, then a second material for the tiles, and then there's a very tiny Z modeled uh, rectangular shape just use, the, you have to understand probably a lot of these lighting elements I don't just uh, drop in say an area light like you might within a, another 3D package what I do is I actually build geometry uh, thinking that the geometry in mind will be um, turned into area light and or emissive materials so in this case uh, I wanted to have the ultimate amount of contrast in between uh, far distance light uh, that I have set up uh, along the street and up the street and then also plus the environment and so I get some nice blends here where we have uh, a very high contrast here at this side of the pillar but maybe a lit wall uh, and then this track lighting the bottom half of the pillars to sort of bring out some of their shapes and then some of the natural environment light from the HDRI uh, plus a piece of geo that sits right about here there's a donut torus that sits on both sides of the awnings of this to give it sort of uh, some light that would represent uh, different area lights that would be projecting lights off frame uh, onto the building uh, so that we could light one area and then have a warm on this side and a cool on this side. So in other words, we get like some high specularity off of this object here, kind of. Uh, if you've watched uh, Blade Runner, the original Blade Runner films, uh, which is basically this is a a model that I built to sort of uh, represent uh, an inspiration by Blade Runner and some of its scenery. Uh, and to note, actually, uh, probably if you remember the scenes with J.F. Sebastian's uh, Bradbury building, which is an actual building here in Los Angeles, um, although truth be told, it does not have these pillars. Uh, the real Bradbury building is, is epic on the inside, but the facade on the, on the entrance of the building is actually a little bit more flat. Than, than this uh, but I, I per the design of the film I'm not exactly sure who designed the original pillars here I think there was another that was fashioned after one of Sid Mead's design but I'm, I'm not sure if I've ever seen that he was the designer of this uh, circular pillar here but it has a, a very nice uh, sort of uh, old school feel I guess uh, maybe sort of like a, a classicism uh, bit of design motif to it and, and some of the filigree at the top of the pillar was really nice to try to uh, replicate in a design and what I did was I used uh, some simple toruses uh, circular uh, shapes um, like uh, donuts and or you know cylinders and use the Z modeler to sort of squeeze down some shapes I think uh, a lot of these ridges here this is all like a uh, uh, a curved tube brush and then uh, working in Dynamesh I kind of spaced them and twisted the the 
uh, radial draw of the I used a radial symmetry to draw out some of the curved tubes and then twisted the object so that I could get a nice wrap and then merged it with the rest of the dynamation mesh shape uh, I think I did uh, the same for these uh, round bits on this segment of the pillar and then just uh, used also uh, an, an inside sort of cylinder tube shape to do a few wrap around uh, curved tube uh, brush strokes uh, if you recall, if you draw out a curved tube and holding shift, pull, and drag out from an object, it will totally wrap around the cylinder or shape that you're trying to draw through. So in a lot of ways, uh, the same technique was used for this pillar uh, and then same time uh, used it for the awning uh, and then maybe dynameshed it or uh, I think maybe up the shape uh, for the awning and stuck it to the geometry. So. You, Basically what you're looking at is a pillar, uh, a couple of floor panels that I used, light trim, tile, back wall, uh, main pillar for the side of the building, another uh, maybe a couple few rectangles that have been uh, sized and shaped using the world space widget uh, that were Z modeled for these bits of the structure. Then additionally there's a flat pane for the glass. Uh, I would have to actually show you the key shot model which I'll, I'll flip over to in a moment. Um, this tier here in the flooring, uh, I might have mentioned this last time, and again, another shout out. I used a plug-in in a separate bit of software. Um, a friend of mine's uh, application called, uh, it's actually a plug-in for Blender, uh, for hard surface materials. It does like very, very complicated Boolean system stuff. But I used a box cutter and hard ops uh, to cut out one. But the geometry wasn't quite right, so I came over to uh, ZBrush and fixed it up uh, and made it you know able to be sort of drawn as an uh, insert mesh and then I duplicated and, and set up the floors uh, into tiers. Uh, this part again is probably all of these round bits here same as the awnings uh, curved tube and then duplicated that wrap up. Uh, smaller bits here of the building I just basically just worked from a cube and just built up uh, smaller segmented uh, details like the little AC units and I left them simple so that I would have enough room to sort of illustrate over them later. Uh, and probably new additions since last time I streamed uh, would be the parking meters from Blade Runner, in which uh, basically you're looking at one, two uh, pieces plus a lens cap, and there's a small bulb. It's kind of hard to make out here, but I'll flip over to ZBrush. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, basically, in fact, let me zoom in here. Oops, wrong key. See, my fingers my fingers want to do PC commands, but I'm on Mac right now, and then when I get back to my Mac, I'm going to be think, looking for that command button. It's so, so disorienting. Man, I, wish, I just wish, like, one keyboard could do it all. You know? Not the special stuff. So this is what the geo looks like for these side buildings and it's probably pretty much the same but since I'm going to be turning my POV at an angle really you don't recognize so much distance in between the gaps uh, and I don't know if I have the same perspective set up on this one but uh, this is probably close to finish stage I think I might have added one other building in a file that I was using on my PC and I need to maybe reopen this uh, to make sure that it's the same one. But if I wanted to single out some elements, here I'll take a look at this. Uh, I'll turn dynamic solo on, and we could just look at an individual spotlight. Or actually, street light, excuse me. So this is uh, kind of a combination between doing some Boolean operations, uh, kit bash, and also just using the Z model. So I modeled out the shape of the street lamp, I think, uh, in this case, because I wanted to do some complex uh, bevels, I might have used an outside package and then brought the shape in as an OBJ, uh, and then further used the Z Modeler tool to set up some edge loops. Uh, and if you look at this, actually, let me explain how this is, because there's some cool stuff in there. It's kind of like building a few different models to build one. And if I can just uh, 
click here just once. There we go. So underneath here, all of these street lamps actually have a piece of inserted geometry which is on a separate uh, subtool because a lot of the times, if you recall, uh, I was using a, a sort of trick in, in ZBrush where I have added some extra features on the top of my uh, menu sled. And if you hold down the command key uh, for Mac and I believe the control key for PC, you can actually slide this menu around. So I've, I've set up some really quick shortcuts uh, that I use a lot, like um, split unmasked points, because I, if I'm using like insert uh, mesh brushes to build geometry, like using the just like standard primitives plus Q mesh, uh, what I'll do is I'll you know do a lot of splitting. So if I if I draw something on and I split it, I re rename it very quickly, uh, and then I you know maybe merge it back down, uh, merge visible. Uh, before I, you know, really place uh, a built object into a scene or something like that. Uh, so these are just uh, quick shortcuts, especially the mirror, mirror, and weld unify, because sometimes uh, moving geometry around, I get off center and I need to unify it uh, back to the unified space uh, so that it would hit uh, the default axis of being right at zero for the X, Y, and Z. All right. So, uh, this is only sort of following loosely some, it's kind of hard to find some ref for <laughs> some of the set dressings from Blade Runner, especially the old one. It's been, what, 35 years? Uh, but it's after scouring the internet a, a little bit, I kind of wanted to build something basically very similar. So uh, I'd like to think somewhere in my mind, I'm thinking after the events of the first movie, but in between uh, that in 2049, something like that. But I, I've always... You know, kind of dreamt about. Uh, well, what if I built an alternate set block, like some of the similar motifs, like the the pillars and the buildings, uh, street lamps and parking lamps, uh, and then you know maybe it's like the scene that we've seen, but like uh, which buttons? Ah, these buttons here actually, it's quite simple. If you go to preferences, uh, and I believe under config, and you enable the customize. Uh, up here, you can actually, I think it's either Command or Command Alt, you can, or Command Shift. I, I have to play with it for a second to remember off the top of my head. I, I can't remember, but uh, I believe also in the Cl Z Classroom, it, they have some videos that are very specific to set up your own UI and custom menus. But you can slide all of the feature buttons uh, from any of the tabs, from any of part of the interface. Uh, either to the side or up top, right? So when you put them up top, I just extended mine. I already had a UI that I studied and tried to build. Uh, I keep mine pretty close to stock. Like I don't, I don't have too much customization going on, although I know that it's possible to do it. So here's the default half of this top tier, right? I think uh, for my own personal UI I added some stuff like uh, store MT when I'm doing like morphing and whatnot uh, for sculpting uh, midpoint value and uh, radial fade uh, that has to do with making like uh, ZBrush alphas grab dock as well uh, which is basically it makes a duplicate uh, of the geometry as into an alpha uh, when you're creating like uh, alpha stamp brushes or something like that uh, lazy mouse settings and whatnot for when I'm drawing on clay uh, but sort of a new addition to me, oops, sorry, me changing my own U, personal UI. Uh, I added a lot of the features from split unmasked points, uh, merge down, merge visible. Merge visible basically takes all of the visible subtools uh, and joins them into one subtool that you can pick from the tool menu. Uh, and I do that because uh, sometimes I want to just grab a solid chunk that so, of something that I've built and either append it or use it as an individual tool that I can later, uh, you know, uh, mess with by modeling it or uh, kicking it over to Keyshot or someplace else to, to work on it. Uh, maybe at times, sometimes I need to retopologize something, and so I need to merge visible of everything and then kick it to another application so I can work for, on it from there. But that's pretty much, uh, yeah, yeah. You can slide, you can slide the the entire shelf here. So if like if you hold just down the command button slide it about you know you could add a myriad of things I'm sure up here uh, 
in fact, I wanted to add a lot of the stuff from uh, Live Boolean Keyshot, and I probably will extend this off in, in the future and, and keep using it. But yes, yes. And yes, on the online documentation, you can find out a lot about customizing your uh, interface. Um, a couple of videos I, I can't say for sure, but I, I know that in the ZBrush Classroom, there are extensive videos on setting up your UI. Uh, but anyway, let's get back to things. So now that I've let you guys kind of take a look at what the scene entails as far as the geometry, so I'm keeping it simple because there are certain areas that I'm going to want to later paint in, uh, and there are just enough bits of uh, geo that I've put in here. So this ground plane doesn't extend out, but I think it probably I'll, I'll paint in the gap. But there are actually two different ground planes here. So if I turn it to an absolute ortho from the side or front view, excuse me, uh, and then I turn off dynamic perspective. It may be hard to see, but there's a ground plane, and some geo extends through the bottom of it, but that's okay, because the ground plane was duplicated. And what I did was I made some impressions into the street, uh, and then used the flat ground plane to do one specific effect, and that is, I'm gonna go over to my image in Photoshop. Come back. I actually wanted to add puddles of water along the rendered asphalt. So I'm going to be playing with that a little bit and adding some elements of uh, street trash. It, it looks good and it looks weathered, but it look, could use a little bit more weathering and a few other finer details. Uh, maybe also some strewn bits of uh, trash and whatnot along the street. So I'm kind of basically setting up all of the major parts of geometry that I can use uh, without having to really paint in large forms by hand. Right? So, uh, as a 2D artist, uh, you know, I'm using 3D to basically set up my stage, texture it, and then take that base and then do an actual painting over it. So, I guess I'm, I'm going to try to go for some photorealism, uh, but I'm going to be tweaking some layers and doing some uh, things as far as like clipping mask and whatnot. So, let me go back and. Actually, let me see if I have uh, a more updated version of this file. Because actually there is a building missing. And I want to keep it exactly the way that it was. So I'm just going to check and make sure. Uh, everything in this file has been meticulously named. In fact, you know what? Let's just do this. Give me one second here. I'm going to open up Keyshot. Running Keyshot 7. Yes, uh, Blindness, I believe your name is. Uh, you can uh, you can move some of those things around. Uh, it's just, just the command key and clicking and dragging. Like, if you actually physically click and, and drag it to move it, you can move the, the top tier of the menu and in uh, ZBrush. So let me know if you guys have any questions. Uh, I'll try to keep an eye on things on the side and answer as much as I can. So, looking okay, at we clock, we're 30 minutes in. Okay, so I'm gonna try to open uh, up my file here. And... Demo. Sure, it's from today. Yep, there we go. So, since this is going to take me a second to open because there is a lot of geometry to open up here, uh, you'll have to forgive me if maybe it gets a little unclear. Uh, Keyshot, depending on what type of GPU you have. Uh, probably doesn't matter so much for GPU. It's all CPU re rendered, I believe. Uh, in fact, I think it's 99% CPU uh, render in Keyshot. Um, and I'm not sure exactly how much of the GPU it might actually account for, but 
uh, every once in a while when you're turning objects uh, it looks a little pixelated or grainy and then uh, giving it a few seconds it gets a little bit more finite and the image becomes clearer and clearer the more you wait so you'll have to give me a second to uh, get this opened up I'm sorry I had to actually save it from one machine and move it to another so that I can continue the stream. But we'll open it up. In the meantime, if I can answer anything from anyone, here's a great chance to ask, as I have a second. Teach us the way, I will teach you the way. So some cool things that I wanted to actually talk about. How many of you guys have ever used um, the actual render passes from Keyshot and or from doing a BPR in ZBrush? Uh, how many of you guys actually use everything from AO, Shadow, Geometric Normal Pass, which is a particular point I wanted to talk about today? Uh, I think I'm going to try to show you guys how I use it because I just recently found out how to use those and it's like it's like voodoo it's like like special magic using that thing uh, and also some of the non-destructive uh, workflows that you have in and around masking in Photoshop I'm I, I, I'm an avid Photoshop user but some of the deeper features of Photoshop sometimes uh, depending on what I'm doing I haven't used uh, so every once in a while I go out and I do my homework uh, and try to figure out things and how they work. Uh, lucky, luckily there are a ton of Photoshop uh, demos, tutorials out there uh, and so to combine that power along with, photo, er, with ZBrush uh, for sculpting and rendering uh, are some awesome tools. So I'm going to be going through some of that uh, and also if you have never used a Z-Depth Pass, I'm specifically going to also talk about that. Uh, some of the sort of pitfalls in trying to export some of those I should probably mention, so I'm going to try to do that. Sorry guys, this is a kind of big file to open. I should have probably tried to open it and move it, or move it and then open it uh, a little bit before stream because it takes a second to actually open it. There's so much geo and it goes through so much of the list and I think some of the materials I need to make sure that they carry over. Uh, generally with Keyshot I know that uh, if you're moving it, moving your entire project from one machine to another it's probably a good idea to package some of it. I believe there's a feature inside of uh, Keyshot that's kind of similar to something like say Maya where you can uh, sort of zip up your entire scene and move it. And luckily, uh, ZBrush usually doesn't have this problem. If you save a project file, the project is, is as it is on one machine to the next when you move it. Uh, so bear with me here. Hopefully I won't take up too much time. Uh, while that's loading up, there's some a few things that I'm going to show you there, but I'm going to go back to Photoshop while we wait here. So as I'm going to come back and talk about that as soon as that gets open, I wanted to show you sort of like the output of what happens when you come out of Keyshot. So although I'll be going through some specific settings to show you how that file is set up and how the render was set up before I rendered it, I, I won't show you an actual render because it, it, if however long it takes to render it, uh, you, we could be sitting from 20, 15 minutes to, you know, to a half an hour or an hour. Uh, but the longer you give it, probably the more samples it takes, uh, depending on your options, and then you know you get a final image. So this is a final image that I output last night, and there's a couple of things that I want to do before uh, I get going. One is that I wanted to mention that this is a 32-bit Photoshop file, right? And I, that is so that we can get the dynamic range out of a few different things. One is I'm going to try to prepare this by going into uh, layer matting and this RGBA is actually my beauty pass so if I wanted to actually let me click this and I'll just label it I'm all thumbs with the typing today 
Anyway, so there's my beauty pass. Uh, and then I'll flip through a couple of these, but uh, basically you come with a clown pass. So I have an option clicked to set up a clown pass. And basically what this pass is, is once you do a render, uh, it will make a pass called a clown pass of each different material change. So basically if I wanted to do some quick selecting and use the magic wand tool in Photoshop, uh, I could come and keep this on top uh, and come through and basically select uh, each portion of this. Uh, not sure why. We could use quick selection, I suppose, but I just wanted to use a uh, magic wand. And for some reason, ah, it doesn't work with 32 bit. But we're going to change it from 32 bit and actually down sample just a little bit. Uh, but this is basically for quick selection, right? Uh, and that selection is so that I can take and say just get the windows or just get the street lamp, just get like say the asphalt of the street. So each various material uh, plus like certain lighting elements has a clown past mask and it's just for doing uh, very complicated or quick uh, selections of masks, right? You could either use this with the uh, magic wand tool. Also, in the select area, there's a uh, in the selection menu. There's should be a not modify but color range. Sorry, uh, and probably because uh, I am working straight from a 32-bit, there's a few options here that we wouldn't be able to normally use. Right, so color range is one of them, and I actually have a set up a, a little bit of setting up to do on two different passes. Uh, to make them ready uh, to use in our render. But just to show you, there's a clown pass, an ambient occlusion pass, a shadow pass, so these are all the thick heavy black shadows, uh, which I'll probably use uh, minimally, I suppose. Um, it, it'll be either probably more of one or the others, uh, because doubled with AO, sometimes it can the image can get just a little bit too dark, and so it takes some finessing to kind of dial both of these back up. Uh, there is a reflection pass, which basically I believe is all of the high specularity reflection points in the pass, right, and how they're lit. So there's a green light that will probably go in this major shape along this building, but it's also casting some of that light reflection uh, and some of the specularity from some of the edge wear in a lot of the different materials. Uh, and if I intensify this, a lot of these will be uh, set up as linear dodge layers, right? But there's a few of them that will be probably multiply, like AO and shadow, right? So AO, shadow, uh, and then reflection, uh, and then there's an entire lighting pass, which is pretty simple. It's just, it's mostly just the, the almost very close to it, sort of like a global illumination map where you have just mostly lighting sources along the surfaces of different things. Uh, but speaking to lighting, I'm not sure exactly how much of this lighting and or this reflection pass that I'm going to use, because in the lighting pass, uh, I'm actually going to use and set up this file to use the uh, geometric normals, or sort of like a world space normal for the 2D image. And I'll be able to uh, change that lighting source on the fly. And I'm going to show you how to set it up. Uh, this is something that mystified me for a long time, but once I saw it, I was and, and actually saw how it worked. Uh, I was like, "Oh my God, this is the best thing since sliced bread." So, lighting pass, uh, and then we have a color diffuse pass, which is basically all of the flat colors and texture from all of the buildings, all of the structures, uh, put into one. Uh, and then we have our geometric normal, right? So this is an actual normal map, and this will be used to control dynamic lighting. Okay, And then finally, and it's kind of hard to tell from here, but we have a depth pass. Now this looks like just a regular um, alpha mask, or alpha channel mask, uh, but it's actually more than that. And this is kind of the main reason why I did this render in 32-bit, because uh, although Keyshot, it will Generally, if a non-32-bit uh, fashion render has been outputted, 
it will not show you the dynamic range or the pre uh, the pre multiplied uh, image. It'll just look flat, black and white. But there's actually much, much, much more to this, uh, and I should probably show you. So before anything messing with the Z depth pass, I'm going to come back to my beauty pass uh, and take a look at it. And what I want to do is go to layer matting and defringe and basically what this is going to do is I'm going to set a width either one or maybe two pixels and basically it just sort of kind of comes around and cleans up some of the edge the selected edge in and around uh, these areas where there's a transparency set up and it sort of takes out some of the pixelation Oop, sorry about that it picks off some of the uh, sort of uh, nasty bits in and around the selection because if you look at it it looks quite grainy actually right so there's that uh, in and around the channels I'm gonna put this over here so that I can keep it about uh, just make this a little bit smaller I'm gonna keep it handy so I'm gonna dock it to the bottom of this uh, what I want to do first is do that matting and then one more thing is I noticed that some of the lighting from some of the materials for the glass put a small cast of red light which I think probably would have taken a long time to you know properly parse out on different materials or like maybe when the sample rate interacts with other materials it leaves some small bits of artifacting in and around the image it doesn't always look that great so uh, I thought that it might be a good idea if I used uh, filter noise and actually I'm gonna have to do that after I switch it from 32 to maybe something else so I'm actually gonna downsample it to maybe 16 or 8-bit uh, in a little bit so that I can do some other preparatory things uh, to kind of fix some of that problem is uh, I think if I run to speckle maybe it might get rid of some of that uh, these small tiny uh, little red dots that ended up in certain areas and maybe it'll fade it out into a nice uh, blend so that I can take care of it. Um, I could probably just paint over it if I wanted to or just use like a clone tool and, and sample it out. But it probably won't be able to do that because it's 32-bit. So while we're in 32-bit I think I want to come back to the depth pass and I'll show you guys kind of how you set one of these. I'm going to take this and actually make an adjustment layer uh, and then do this adjustment layer as uh, an exposure. And if I look at the properties for that exposure, oops, come on now, there we go. All right. In fact, I'll take this and I'll double click here, and on the properties, it'll show me uh, what's going on. So the exposure, I'm just going to drop it like much way down, right? And if I look at the bottom here, there are color pickers here. This first one is a dark one, and the last one is a light one. And I think this is probably a mid-tone, right? But I'm going to use the absolute dark one and grab the furthest, farthest object to the front and just click it. And then secondly, I'm going to grab the white picker. And I know that there's some bright areas up here, so I'm just going to click right up here. And basically, you'll see the, that this is forming out with different gray values. And this is basically telling Photoshop, uh, via its gray values, what the depth of objects are in order. Hayden, not now, please. You know, say excuse me, my kids are about the house. So I'm just going to go ahead with the black, black color picker and click it and I think that's good enough and that's sharp enough so what I'll go ahead and do is hit this layer here get my depth and I'll use command or control E and merge the two because uh, that adjustment and the layer are good to go yes it is quite a huge scene uh, and I'll click that and I'll use the label to do Z depth Excuse me for one second.
Alexa, turn on the dining room light. Sorry, something's wrong. To control dining room light, disable the TV and light skill, and then re enable. Sorry about that. It's getting a little dark in this room. The sun's going down here in Los Angeles. Okay, so uh, I have my Z depth passed, and what I'm going to do now is just go and hit Command A or Control A, selecting all, copy the image, and go back to my channels and make a new channel, which would be this icon here. Click it and paste it. Right? And it looks like some of the values change, but really, uh, once I flip it to uh, more of a down sampled, image so going from uh, the mode going from 32 bit actually to 16 or 8 this will actually level back out so it's just changing from the I guess what would, would probably be the either like very similar to an HDR toning or um, the, the, the values are not set they're gonna be more closer to what I originally established by running the exposure so I'm gonna deselect this and I'm just gonna label this one for convenience sake Instead of alpha 1, I'm going to go Z depth, pass. There we go. I'm going back to RGB. And see, once I click back on the RGB, all of the values leveled back out and it went back straight. So I don't need this anymore, so I'm just going to hide it and come back to my beauty pass. Because I'm going to be using that later and I'm going to show you. Oops, no, 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 don't do that. Uh, I'm going to show you guys later how to use. Uh, sort of the lens blur to, to use this channel to do some uh, dynamic focusing you know like uh, you can focus any part of this like say if I wanted to draw more focus on the, the front foreground uh, I could do that versus uh, let's put that back uh, versus um, you know maybe something off in the, the far ground or back, farthest background if I want to blur those out, I can do that dynamically on the fly. And what it does is it uses that Z depth pass to figure out the distance and the focal amount, uh, and and basically it'll you know uh, sort of change some properties to your uh, depth of field, right? Because it, the camera that I set up in Keyshot, let's let's take a look and see if it's finally open. Okay, so here we go. So some of these some of these materials might have not translated well, but that's quite all right. We have our scene. So basically, uh, this is the shot, right? The same one as the one in Photoshop. And if I were to click on my camera, you see that I have one uh, POV or uh, point of view, sort of a, a scripting term, but uh, POV will be sort of closer to the ground, looking up towards the buildings, yeah? Uh, and I'll go, I have this locked. So all of the properties that I've set up as far as like um, the depth of field, uh, I think I selected a, a focal distance somewhere near here or here in the neon sign. Uh, and I checked my, or actually I, I think it, when I click on the object, I did a select focal point, uh, so which automatically sets the focal distance in the f-stop, right? Uh, and then I just locked the camera so that I have that POV. And it was, it was good enough to, for me to set it so that I, I can make an actual uh, uh, z-depth pass mask from right uh, just to arrange some things I made sure that all of the buildings in the very far background would could make it into the shot and so there's only a tiny little bit of sky and I might be painting some details uh, back in here under the actual beauty pass layer uh, as well as on top of it in, in a series of layers uh, along with and I just found this out, actually, I should have done it this way, but uh, this is sort of a more of a specific thing to key, uh, key shots scene order, but you can actually set up uh, duplicates within your scene. Uh, so I duplicated the scene lights here for the street lamps, with the little parking meters. Uh, and these, well, are physically in the model. These, I think I only made one of them uh, when I kicked it over from ZBrush into Keyshot. And then selected all of the parts and just uh, did a duplicate, uh, which when I duplicate it, it will give you a world space widget to move it. So I just spaced them out a little bit so that I can continue down the street. 
And a lot of this area I left blank because there are some hand-painted details that I'm going to be uh, adding into this building. In fact, maybe even coming back in later at a, at a point uh, and grabbing another material. So like, all of these materials are there and this is for the beauty pass for the first run. But additionally, uh, maybe between this broadcast and next, I might do another run where I take some other types of materials uh, just for a few other extra passes um, and material uh, breakups and actually just drag and drop them onto an object and change it, right? So if I do that, there'll be some more, you know, uh, maybe specularity or if I used a, a chrome material or if I made, uh, actually, if you could probably use the tune shader which, or, which outlines the curvature of an object quite well. You could probably use something like that for edge wear. Uh, so remember that nothing is set with some of these objects. You can always go back uh, to your original uh, scene, and as long as you save the camera, you can always get this very exact same shot. Just remember to lock it and then use the free camera to move around the scene. So I'm going to grab my mouse here and just while I'm on the free camera, I'm going to show you how this is set up uh, in an order of geometry. It's a little slow moving because it's quite he a, a hefty file. <laughs> You'll have to excuse me for that. But uh, maybe a little slightly faster on my PC. I think my PC has got a little higher spec than my, my Mac here. I'm using my vintage uh, Intel uh, Mac Pro Tower, uh, which is an 8 core almost on par with my, my PC, but maybe just slightly older. But uh, it has a decent decent GPU in it, and so uh, lots of RAM as well. So maybe slow, but not, not too bad. So bear with me. But I just uh, spaced some of these out so that I could get sort of the PO shot that I, or POV shot that I wanted. Uh, I made these actually quite smaller in scale because as you look from the ground level, uh, the buildings that are in the very far ground don't need to be as tall. Uh, so basically everything in the main part of the scene is going to be larger and scaled up. Uh, and then some of the buildings in the back can be smaller. And because I have a perspective that's set, I think I, I've set my perspective to represent a, a 35 millimeter camera. Uh, everything will basically fit into frame. Uh, if I rotated it, there's some building detail on the very top of the roof for these side buildings and maybe some uh, lights here. So if I wanted to maybe do a secondary shot and pull just the skyline, I could probably turn it and get it into POV and set up another shot that would be somewhat like this and just work some uh, extra stuff into the background if I wanted to. That's why I went through the trouble of adding lights uh, or geometry for lights on top. So there may be another follow-up image to this, which would be great. Uh, but really, when you look on the back side of this building, there's not much to it. It's just the tiers. I haven't really built it out because I, I'm, I'm not going to show it. Uh, because of the angle, I haven't added any doors yet on the inside of the entrance. But uh, I'm sure that's another detail that I could probably add in. But in between some of the buildings and the strips here, I, in ZBrush, added some 2D planes. So these planes basically represent uh, sort of like some rim or cast lights that I'm using uh, that I placed in between the geometry and then dropped what is a area light material. So if I go edit, uh, right clicking, edit material, uh, I just chose like the area light 1200 lumen white which I changed to wattage and it's quite strong but sometimes I, I bring the power back down and I change the color and it cast a nice light uh, or cast light from the building upwards. Yeah, So it looks like maybe there's a separate bit of light source that's coming from up this, the street. If we were to imagine like a, uh, a set of buildings and then this is the corner and then there's a street or a small street in between, uh, some lit signage so that would cast some color over this building uh, and the green extending on the road and, and the side of the building up here. Uh, and depending on the angle of the POV, there's another green one or blue one that is cast on this largest uh, foremost building here, right? So just a little bit of cast light uh, that might be coming off of this. 
Of course, all of this this geometry, like if you needed to move some of these area lights, they're just simple uh, 2D planes. So you could take some of these, like this one, say for example, uh, go to scene. If you click on scene and then click on the object, it'll show you a selection outline of the object. And then if you were to right click on it, you can actually move the selection or part which will give you a world space widget and then you can pull X, Y, or Z handles uh, to move the actual model selection, right? So maybe if I wanted those highlights alongside of the building to be a little bit higher up and more into the shot, I could arrange it as so, then just hit the green check mark and it's set, right? Right clicking again, edit material, you could make this uh, more intensified or less. I probably wouldn't go over 1200 too much uh, I would probably go more down, but because it's in between the buildings, I wanted a very strong uh, light, so I left it pretty much as is. It's just changed from wattage or lumen to wattage, right? Uh, and then it just will cast it alongside of the building. So pretty much that's how that was set. Uh, and then probably as I was going to speak on before, but I couldn't get this file loaded fast enough. Uh, I'll show you what my render panel looks like. So just very quickly, and as far as output goes, uh, I have chosen a place to, I, usually by default it's in the renderings of uh, Keyshot's install, uh, so that everything I open uh, into Photoshop is going to be in this folder. Uh, a selected uh, file name. Uh, by way of trying to get my Z-depth passed and everything else as far as these layers outputted well, uh, I chose to output as a 32-bit. If you do not do 32-bit, like let's say for example you went down and you just grabbed a PSD, right? The PSD, uh, which will probably be 8-bit, will unfortunately take the depth pass and save it out as a separate file. It will not include it because all I've chosen to add all of these render layers to the Photoshop file. Uh, the depth pass will be separate if it's anything less than 32. So that's why uh, I've chosen to go with a PSD 32-bit so that I can get all of the passes uh, fit into uh, the entire thing. So uh, depending on your version, as you saw there, uh, it may be a little bit different. But yes, all uh, Ox Art V, yes, all of these render passes are from Keyshot. Uh, similarly so in ZBrush, if you were to go to the render palette, uh, render properties, you could change everything here as far as choosing which uh, passes that you were going to get as far as like uh, say, I don't know, uh, ambient occlusion, uh, surf surface scatter you might be using. Some people sculpt you know, using HD geometry. Uh, and then, of course, there's some 3D shading stuff that would affect how your render might come out, uh, smoothing the normals, perhaps, uh, and how detailed that you want your render. Uh, but also the render pass, the BPR render pass, is basically where you're going to click and save out all of the passes that you've chosen from those properties. right? So if I chose ambient occlusions, shadow, uh, I get the mask, uh, S SSS, or subsurface scatter, uh, plus the image itself will be the actual beauty pass. Uh, you could probably also choose to add uh, a normal pass from here or put a normal material and then uh, actually customize sort of a geometric normal. But from Keyshot, I can just click and choose all of the passes that I'm going to use. So uh, kind of going back a little bit, when I set this up, I had a lot of graininess problems early on. Uh, so one of the things that I think I tried to sort of kink out or problem solve is using a custom setting, uh, turning ground illumination off, I wasn't using it in this case, uh, increasing the shadow quality all the way up to 5, uh, and then doing a ray bounce uh, that was maybe a little bit low, uh, maybe 3, and I'm sure maybe I can up this uh, as I want to, and depending on how long I let it render, it, things might get a little bit more clear and a little bit more finite. Uh, but that's what that lighting pass looks like. 
uh, for you know I mean because it, it's you can either choose you know between say basic product uh, interior and um, what have you depending on what your task is in this case I just chose a custom right so going back up to render or just control or command P P is in Paul uh, you can do uh, just diffuse lighting uh, I did in my case reflection shadow ambient occlusion again uh, clown pass depth pass and the geometric normal right and I'm choosing to add those to Photoshop uh, to add on to that I know a lot of people instead of um, doing things all as one render every once in a while in their scene I believe uh, or either the material you can do um, an actual specific render pass uh, so the the render passes I forget, I'm trying to remember how you do it but I think you just label it basically every time uh, you drop a piece of uh, uh, piece of material down on a, a piece of geo you can actually set Keyshot to render out just the materials on an individual file so that you can have absolute control over every aspect in Keyshot. Um, and then you can basically load all of those into a stack, like an automated stack inside of Photoshop. So it's worth looking into. I'm, I'm not going to go too far off into that because it kind of strays from what I was going to show you guys today. But once I did this, uh, I made sure to just do it for uh, a nice timed amount. Uh, I'm using the real CPU or real-time CPU settings, so I'm using uh, I believe 14 cores out of my 8 core uh, machine uh, And then once it rendered out That's how I got the Photoshop document that you guys previously saw So I'm just gonna come back over here go back to this camera Okay, so that's pretty much how I set everything up in Keyshot uh, would love to do it real time if I had a, a supercomputer sitting here with maybe two CPUs and maybe three uh, 1070s. I, I'd probably go through and <laughs> do a crazy rendering job. But for today, uh, I'm on my own personal gear. And I'm just going to try to go through and do a few things to set this up. So we got that uh, Z depth pass set up. Uh, next, and I did the matting to this. I think now probably is a point where I might go ahead and change the mode just ever so slightly so I'll do 16-bit uh, and in this case because I want to use everything I'm not going to merge so don't merge uh, click that and so now it goes from 32-bit uh, to 16 so in some ways, it's kind of sh crazy, but the graininess might have changed a little bit, but I'm still going to run that despeckle quality. Uh, how are we doing on time? Okay, so we're just past an hour and 10 minutes. So now I want to come back up here and set this up. So I have that Z-depth in here in my channels. I'm going to leave it, but now I'm going to actually drop down my normal pass outside of this bring it down a little bit right uh, and some of the other passes that I'm going to actually use like say the diffuse lighting reflection shadow AO clown I'm going to turn those on uh, and I'm actually going to use my clown pass to do one quick thing here I use select color range and I'm going to select all this black here and I'm going to actually add to that just make sure that I have everything that I need there we go uh, and I'm going to say okay and so it's grabbed it and maybe I might modify it just by one pixel clip it uh, modify expand do one pixel only and so that seems pretty sharp enough. Uh, so if you've never used uh, quick masking inside of, here, this is kind of an interesting thing with using clown passes, but if you use uh, quick mask, you can just quickly copy them, the mask and or invert it and just make it a new channel very quickly. 
So on this, I'm just going to go ahead and hit Q to look at it. And so I have pretty much everything masked out that I need. Uh, oops. There we go. So you'll notice that there's sort of a ruby lith pattern over most everything here. Oh yeah, very cool. Yeah, glad to show you guys this because a lot of for the longest time I was actually confused about this myself, and so I'm glad to kind of learn it and then share it with others. But um, this mask here, I actually need to invert it because if I use it as a clipping mask now, if you notice that here most of the mask is black uh, and the upper part is white. I need to actually flip it. So I'm going to hit Q and then on the keyboard hit Command Shift I, which should invert it. It's pretty much the same on PC. If you hit Control Shift I, it will invert a mask. Uh, and now hit Q again and go back into Q, uh, the quick mask mode. And you'll see that everything that was black here is actually uh, part of the mask, right? So I'll take this mask and I'll just drop it down here and make a duplicate. Hit Q, come out, coming out of quick mask uh, mode, and I'll click on it, and I'll just say, uh, all masked, right? But <clears throat> while I have this selection up, I'm going to hit uh, RGB again, uh, and turn off clown. Actually, you know what? Keep the clown on. doesn't matter. Um, I want to assign this mask to everything inside of this group. So I'm not sure if you guys knew this, but if you click on a group, you can actually mask it off. So that I have the selection on, and I'll go ahead and I'll just hit uh, the mask button. And so this mask, uh, layer mask has been applied to every layer inside of this group. So I just mask the whole group instead of specific layers. So put that there, and then I can start turning some of these off and do it as I need it but I don't have to worry about the sky because the sky is already there now specifically one of the things that I wanted to show you guys and I've already hit the Z depth part at least part A of that is working with a geometric normal now a lot of times I was really confused as to how to use this uh, and then I had to do a little bit of research and find out but I would use it as a, an alpha channel in a lot of ways and try to use it for curves or levels on like sort of the more uh, lit areas because once you copy this and put it into a channel usually it would turn gray uh, but I'm going to show you how to use this to the advantage um, and there's a few tutorials like it, it's very hard to find but there are like maybe two tutorials out there that show you how to use this just for my speaking voice, I'm going to take a sip of coffee here. I hope you guys don't mind. There we go. So I'm going to take this normal, and I'm going to try to set this up. So first thing that you're going to need is either an adjustment layer, uh, which down here uh, you can use your uh, adjustment layer button. And I'm going to add in a hue and saturation. Uh, and then I'm also going to add in an, an additional uh, adjustment layer that will be a uh, channel mixer, right? And so there's two things that we're going to use. We're going to use an adjustment layer and we're going to use um, what I believe is a clip mask. And so I'm actually going to take this, these three and I'm going to add them into a new uh, group folder. So I'm going to do this and I'm going to say geo normal pass right uh, and so if I drop this down and, and a, a lot of people might ask well why would I do all of this to create a 2d image isn't the stream about 2d images well yes because I want to be able to set up this 3d model which would give me the most exact uh, perspective that I wanted lighting scenario that I wanted and then I can use Photoshop to do everything that I wanted for a static either matte painting or a static uh, line art drawing uh, all of this uh, but for at least since we have some realistic surfaces here I want to be able to use all of the render passes to set it up to make it sort of uh, a close approximation or composite to whatever elements that I want to use like let's say if I want to use photo, photo elements and uh, grab uh, clip art uh, by clip art I say you know photo stock photography 
uh, to put into the scene and, and basically composite those to, to make it look as realistic as possible. Uh, work with various materials uh, to really kind of flush out um, an idea and, and get it hone it in before I even start doing any type of paint over detail. And so that's pretty much what this this uh, episode will be about, I suppose. But uh, the channel mixer here on top and the hue and saturation and then the normals at the bottom. Uh, but before I get started, I'm going to go ahead and hold down the Option key. And it's the same on Mac and PC, but in between these layers, if you move the mouse in between these, you can drop them down into a quick, uh, into a clip mask. Sorry. So I'm going to go ahead and drop those. And now, if you were to look at this layer, uh, I believe it's one of the hue. I need to view the properties. So I think it's probably Channel Mixer. Uh, one important factor in using this is if you notice that a lot of these channel mixers they all have RGB sliders right same here for hue and saturation it has a hue uh, and I'm not gonna really mess with the saturation and lightness too much but you you totally could uh, and I wouldn't use the colorize necessarily but at least for the hue if I wanted to dynamically change this light you'll start to see what happens here while it's a normal, right? Oop, we'll make that zero. But if I change the hue and bring it all the way up, you notice that it goes from red to blue. And so all of these high blue areas are more than likely going to be the directional lighting that's used from everything, right? If I slide it back the other way, you'll notice that some of that light direction and or color starts to change. So it's the light intensity and direction that starts to change, right? Like I might start to get more highlights along some of this geo here. Like say if I wanted more uh, reflection under the neon sign or from this building here it has sort of a, a swooped bill that goes around, uh, you know, a built-in awning on the structure. Uh, maybe some, some light that's coming from like say 12 o'clock high and casting over uh, on different planes, right? And this side would be darker perhaps, or this is darker, but there are some highlights that, have, that are more generated now on the very edge. So it's like maybe some of the cast lighting. So to change some of the, these elements, I can use the hue and the sliders to dynamically change some of those lighting elements, right? And then I can go up to the channel mixer, click on it and go back to properties. And I can start messing around with my red balance. And I can slide and move the green. All right. And the blue. Um, and you can really kind of flip flop in between different directional lighting, right? If I change this a little bit more, and also the lighting intensity will probably drastically change, but you can operate it into the other side of the spectrum. Like that looks a little bit moody, so I'm sure probably all the light intensity is going to be on all everything that that sort of that high yellow color, uh, and then you know. Uh, It'll be probably on the smaller details rather than the broad area of details. In fact, you get some yellow up here and just kind of like a specularity lighting. But more importantly, now that you have this and you kind of under understand how you can flip flop uh, the geonormal values around. So in other words, I could have light that comes from up the street here past the street light, or I can intensify some of the backdrop buildings uh, and, and you know like the planner surfaces that are forward facing. Uh, or the edges might have more light depending on how I adjust this, right? And so forth and so on. But more importantly, how do you composite this with the rest of this? Because layered over, uh, all of this, you know, is not going to necessarily be affected on this beauty pass, right? And it's, I'm not, all of these are normal. I'm not setting them, uh, their blend modes to anything else. But what you can do is go to channel, hit monochrome here 
<laughs> and this will show you more so uh, all of the lighting directions probably a little bit more uh, with an understanding view versus your uh, versus your RGB view of this yep that's gonna stay exactly master and custom uh, and then here I'm gonna change the normal itself to color dodge right and with that it will actually composite into the scene right so now if I try this let's see see how all of these specular points pick up a little bit more increase my blue and so maybe the floor or these bits might get a little bit more uh, you can I'm sure that probably Maya has its own way of making a geometric normal but it's basically just a 2d image uh, and a normal of that so as one of the passes I selected a normal uh, and then I brought it into my layers and made it into a group. But more, the, the two important ingredients of this is that I'm using these clip masks, and these clip, clip masks are parented down to this normal layer. So the, the normal I used, once I added the clip mask, didn't you notice that perhaps this, this normals label on the layer actually got an underscore? So I believe that this underscore makes this layer the parent, and these two are the sub uh, uh, adjustment layers that are attached to it with their individual masks being one of the entire city scene uh, and then this one which will be in fact on this channel on the channel mixer I forgot to add uh, one small element uh, but we can fix that right now so I'm actually going to take and select this select all uh, actually, uh, you know what? I can just do it this way. Sorry, I'll go back to RGB. And since I had this, you can actually right click in the mask from the, the group. Uh, or you know what? Sorry, I'm being crazy about this, but you can probably bring this up and then here adds uh... oh that's crazy I could disable the mask right or you know what probably I could just go back and reset it but it, it actually should have the mask uh, that is this mask. I was trying to see if I could just make it uh, load the, the selection and just uh, copy and paste it to there, but there isn't an option for it. But I, I can fix it later. It's not a big deal. But uh, I'll just enable it back again. Or you know what? Just delete it. Delete it. And then go ahead and since I have the mask loaded, just hit it again. Oops. Release clipping mask. Sorry about that. Just gonna fix this really quick. That's weird. Hold on one second. I'm sorry. I'm just gonna delete these and delete this and load this again. Simple fix, and then add. Sorry, just have to go back up here and redo this. So now that I have that loaded, I'm just going to go ahead and make a new uh, channel mixer. 
right? And that should have probably have the proper mask on it. And then option click and put this back. And then reset this. So we click monochrome here, and there we go, fixed, right? So basically, changing these properties between their RGB sliders will change some of the intensity of our lights. So I could drop green or bring them up. So now here on this plane here, I have a uh, higher light, but I can also come back down here, double click that to view its properties and change the hue. So I'll go actually to the, towards the other end. And that way I flip the light and it's brighter over here. Uh, and then go back again. And so this just takes a little bit of fine tuning, but it's very advantageous to use. Uh, especially when you, you want to play with different uh, lighting scenarios. So there's one more step to this that I'm going to show you, and then I'm going to move on uh, over to Z depth. So kind of liking where this is going. Maybe drop intensity of blue just ever so slightly. So I have a little bit more light in this area here. Uh, and along the specularity since I had that uh, plane that the 2d plane set up down the sh down the street um, But you can set it up so that you can dynamically change a lot of this light So before I get too long-winded here. I'm gonna go back and In between these two adjustment layers. I'm gonna make a new layer and as long as I use uh, say for example a red or a blue or a green you know RGB color I'm gonna use a pure red in this case I could come in I'm gonna get like a pressured airbrush maybe a little bit bigger and you could draw on a layer in between this and lighten a specific area right so let's say if I wanted to draw in some uh, bloom and around these lights here. Do that. And around the neon. Here. And I could also do this with a gradation. So I'm just going to. some details and so now I get like a, a nice bloom for that there's more of that that I'm gonna probably play with a little bit later uh, and then let's say for example I do another one and it, so in between this all of these everything in between this channel mixer and this hue will in the same way sort of start to lighten the effects so this is actually kind of a cool thing if you wanted to ever you know lighten up your scene or do like crazy bloom effects you could start that way and then later uh, there's probably some layers that I'm gonna probably do like a, uh, an FX layer uh, with an inner and outer glow there's a couple of embossed features from which I'm gonna draw some cut lines on some of these buildings but just to show you how sort of like the geometric normal works for you know sort of balancing some of the light changes you could use it for that right and you can add extra layers that are part of the that are parented in with the uh, clip mask uh, to go ahead and do like a color dodge and you know do some nice bloom effects or lighting effects like if I wanted to do the entire area and get lighter up here uh, and darker down here uh, you could use that and of course a lot of your lights between uh, other areas uh, like let's say you know I want to go ahead and do shadow and actually the shadow pass I'm gonna try to smooth it out a little bit so I'm gonna do like a noise a speckle and probably you know one interesting thing is uh, shadow passes are interesting but they're not always uh, accurate and sometimes they can be kind of dark in some ways and the same for AO I think probably shadow might be a little bit more accurate than AO because AO is based off of geometry and the, the changes in geometry. But shadows, you could actually probably load in a, an occluded or either a white material inside of Keyshot uh, or ZBrush. 
uh, and make passes from that and they might have a lot more of a smoother transition because I notice that sometimes when I render these uh, shadow passes they, they tend to be a little bit grainy in some regard uh, but you could you know maybe despeckle it a couple of times and uh, work out some of the kinks uh, and one thing that I learned about this filter just for Photoshop beginners is the difference between some of the noise options here in the noise palette and the filters is that you notice that every other item in this list has a dot 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 or a period uh, three periods the despeckle is the only one that does not and that is because all of these actually have options whereas this one does not it's just one blanketed feature you know you click on it boom done <laughs> so ran despeckle on that a couple of times uh, and basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the blending mode of this layer over to multiply and that just leaves all of the the darks and then I would change the opacity so a lot of times I tend to bring this down uh, quite a bit so that it's not too dark so a lot of things it's kind of strange but as you go it starts to clean up and look a little bit finer um, you get some lighting directions which are, are really nice to use and then of course uh, I'm gonna go ahead and add my AO and this one is a nice soft transition and of course uh, if you wanted to edit this I'm sure that you could you know do something like running levels on it or uh, the brightness and contrast to kind of tighten up some of the white and or dark areas in the shadows uh, but this is good enough so what I'm gonna try to do is go ahead and multiply it as well sorry there we go multiply and of course you know you can bring down the sliders for this as well so I'll do something like that and a lot of these far buildings and stuff like this this, this is going to be some cool areas where I'm going to add some uh, little city lights with uh, nice little hot glows and maybe put in some things flying in a, around that would be kind of neat to do and while I am here I suppose do lighting uh, so diffuse lighting uh, and also this reflection I'm going to select these three and I'm going to make sure that they are linear dodge layers so additive linear dodges and then I'll mess with them individually a little bit later like diffuse maybe uh, I'm going to take it down and lower it quite a bit And just bump it with some extra extra color because depending on the intensity of some of these other ones uh, like shadow uh, you notice that like some of the material color has changed a little bit uh, and maybe a little less graininess in some fashion uh, you might pick up a couple of extra details uh, like this like high yellow little uh, I don't know almost like a patina kind of effect like a copper patina effect and light is happening here uh, so that's kinda cool not too much in the reflections it's a little grainy probably a nice solid maximum samples render might be a little bit better for something like this but pretty much all the detail is there uh, and enough for a paint over right so I'm gonna go up and hit lighting see how this might work out uh, so probably significantly lighter than our original is I'm gonna keep those a little low and the reflections so this is mostly a lot of like specular areas uh, just brightened up Usually anything that's going to add light is going to be uh, linear dodge or screen, I believe. Uh, so just kind of on your, your own personal preference, you can kind of slide these around. Right? I think it's maybe a little too hot white here and maybe up here, but um, I'll probably put in some layers that make some changes. Uh, maybe like a vignette that's multiplied around the edge uh, in a nice few different ways might be kind of cool. Uh, but above all of this, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and 
try to show you some things with the z-depth pass. So I'm going to go up and here's a trick that I use a lot when I'm compositing stuff uh, just to show you really cool, uh, something really cool, really quick. Uh, I make a new layer on top of everything in a lot of ways uh, and I'll hold down the alt button and if you hit this menu here on the layer options and come down and merge visible while holding alt down and click on it it will actually make a composite of every visible layer and so for this now what I'm going to try to do is blur it uh, Let me just take this, invert this, and I'm going to cut that little sky, black sky piece out. Right? So you have something like this. New composite. I can create a new, so I'll call this comp one. And I'll bring that up. And I'll use a gradation tool. I'll pick some sort of sky color, like night sky, really quick. That's good. And then I'll use a gradation style that uses both. And then I'll put in a gradation. And that'll just sit on my uh, on the back there. So I'm not really worried about that. So I'll just do this, label it uh, BG. And that's fine, but more importantly, I want to mess around with uh, some of the depth of field. So on this comp, what I'd like to do is take and go up to filter. And on the blur gallery, I believe, no, sorry, blur, uh, lens blur. And it's kind of a cool effect, but uh, you can do a lot of like smart blurring here. But one of the first things that I'm going to do is I'm going to make uh, take advantage of the depth pass that I saved out. And so under source, I'm going to go ahead and select the channel and hit Z depth pass. And so now it's going to use all of the values in that Z depth pass to uh, do a lot of my focusing. And if you notice that the cursor is a nice crosshair, you can come and click on an area and it will accordingly blur everything else. Right, so like let's say here, if I wanted to focus down here, that will become my fo focal point, and a lot of these areas along here or in the far distance background will become blur. And of course, I can change uh, the radius of that. So let's see, maybe something a little heavier or extreme to show you guys. There we go. So I'll do it by 30. So everything back here is really blurred. This mid-ground building is slightly blurred to a degree. Uh, and everything here in the foreground is blurred, but everything in the center is focused. So if I, again, if I click over here, probably it's going to flip that and change. So these elements are slightly blurred, and the heavy blur is having, ha happening past this corner. And so you get sharp objects here. And so you could go around and find out which you know uh, area looks best for you. Um, and then you know go ahead and comp it in. And when you once you're done, uh, you know don't really want to bother the focal distance that much, but the radius I think you definitely want to change uh, as far as the amount. So. I think for this, myself, I want to use something like uh, maybe 16, and then click here, and then I'll say OK. There we go. And that way I get my smart uh, smart blur and it's exactly on per the depth of field that I set uh, in Keyshot. So it's just using all of the gray information from the Z depth pass, which uh, kind of 
strangely enough, like you can actually use Z depth pass to do some interesting uh, things um, on top of the layers, not necessarily just in channels, but uh, sort of you know using it as a, a mass to kind of cascade. Uh, the depth of some things, it, it, you can interestingly composite it in on the regular layers, uh, just to you know try something different and mess with it. But that's pretty much a Z depth pass is exactly that. Like you can use it with the lens, uh, the the lens blur, and you know choose your focal point and use that that mask to do uh, some sort of smart blurs, right? Okay. So next time in and around uh, when we get to doing things here, uh, I'm going to go ahead and probably start adding some details. But that is basically how I have set up the render. Uh, and then you know you can comp it and then everything else would be after you, after you come up with a composite generally, uh, or at least how I like to work is I'll mess with the render passes, come up with a composite that I like, and then use that as a starting point on a uh, duplicated layer and then start building up from there other smaller details so uh, just to show like if I use some uh, additional layers on this I may do things like using a brush uh, maybe like a hard round to draw some details right and I'll use the color pickle to sample, or sample an area. Uh, and then additionally, uh, I will double click on the layer and use like a bevel emboss. If you click here, you can change the direction of that and the distance. So pulling away from this center point will vastly change the depth of the emboss that you're trying to do. So closer to the, uh, the center point will actually make more of a harsh uh, bevel. And so I'll do that and then I'll go ahead and click OK. And I can do things like this, like drawing in extra details. There we go. So I'll click one area, hold shift, go down so if I make basically a little stroke I mean this is inaccurate but uh, I can fine-tune that push it a little bit away change that to screen or change the color if I wanted to more this way there we go and then see how it looks so it looks like it's not taking too much of an effect but it should draw on there might have to ch mess putts with the effect a little bit but it should put a, a cut groove into it but um, a lot of texture brushes and stuff that I may use and I'm actually gathering some photo sources to put in here and I'm next time around uh, I'm gonna show you guys exactly what I did to paint up some details and I'll leave some areas and then perform them for you so pretty much that's how the render came about uh, and then Hopefully on this comp I'm going to probably erase out some of the light areas and then rebrush over them, uh, bumping up some of their intensity, uh, and then maybe also adding some changes again to the geometric normal to sort of blend in halfway points. So if I change light in one instance and then make a comp layer and then uh, make another comp layer and then change those uh, geometric normal lights again, I can sort of crossfade by using the opacity slider uh, for each layer to kind of get some uh, halfway lit areas so like maybe if I want to take the intensity out of uh, you know light that's coming from up the street uh, and balance it with more stronger lights up here but 
you know, bring back the intensity of here, you could probably do a couple of different comps and just uh, composite them in by dropping the opacity layers. So, that's what I got for today. I hope you guys uh, enjoyed. Any further questions before I log out? Hey, thank you, Riptax. Appreciate it. So I hope you guys, um, in fact, here, I'll just recap very, very briefly uh, so we can go back uh, what I was doing. Uh, and this could probably, you guys could try this for yourselves uh, you know, over the course of the next week, I suppose, until next time I stream. So basically, just going back, we had our original beauty, beauty pass here. here. I'll turn these layers off. Uh, this was the original beauty pass which had some really cool stuff in it and you, of course you know you could probably go for and do some adjustments off of this but uh, I showed you how I set up my render I showed you how I masked it out which passes I use and why uh, how to set up the z-depth pass and also the geometric normal pass I'm only turning this on because it's it's actually a copy uh, we don't actually use it so much so here in the layer group, but more so in the channels, because we're gonna reference it later. Um, so you might ignore that overlap part, but also the geometric normal here, which I will turn these render passes off and show you again. A couple of quick tips uh, for this one. Um, remember, you want to do a clipping mask so that but all of these layers between the channel mixer and the hue and saturation are parented down. Uh, flipping the hue and saturation, excuse me, uh, sorry, not the hue and saturation, but the channel mixer, you want to make sure to make monochrome. And of course, after you set this up, or this upper, pat, uh, upper these two upper or four upper uh, layers uh, up together, uh, and clip mask them down, uh, you'll notice that this uh, normal map will have like sort of an underscore under its naming. That means that it's become the parent. And of course, just color dodge that and it should overlap. So you can change your lighting again, you know, just by simply double clicking on the lighter uh, and messing with your RGB sliders and, you know, however you want to set it up. All right? Adding lights, taking lights out. changing your R, G, and B sliders. So wow, that's pretty strong. Uh, and then down here on hue and saturation, that's really blown out. But of course, you know, change this lightness down a little bit. And maybe the saturation up or down. And you can pull off some really interesting effects. In fact, uh, just changing it a little bit that way made some nice hot points between here and here that were painted in. So these small layers here, just to adjust some of that light, just have like a red uh, channel. And because it sits in between these and it's clip masked in, if I wanted to brush in some lights, I can, you know, of course do that, right? So you have your geometric normal pass and your z-depth pass to play with. Uh, and then, you know, you can just do some other effects to sort of uh, do some paint overs. So I'm going to try to record this process and maybe um, I'll put it up somewhere that you guys can see it. If I happen to work on it this week, I think I'm going to take my time with uh, rendering it out. Uh, but I, I definitely want to share the experience with you. So uh, do look forward to that. And there's some other parts that I may build into this scene. Uh, that'll utilize a few other tools um, uh, the same as what I use to build a lot of this and I look forward to showing it to you so again you guys have a good week any last questions yay nay hope I explained everything well for you guys thanks again to pixel logic for having me uh, on today on on their twitch channel and <laughs> That's an interesting name, I be fapping. But thank you. Cool. All right, guys. Well, do have yourselves a good weekend, and uh, I look forward to having you guys uh, come and see what I'm up to uh, next time around.
All right. Take care. Cheers. Thank you. Peace. Have a good one, guys. Thanks for joining.